I used to play jazz a lot. And a live jazz performance, as you know, is much more exciting uh, than just listening to recordings. And, and I've always been a proponent of live performance. And after, after I got to know Moog, I, I asked him about that, you know, could we do this live? And he was saying that, the, he told me the synthesizers weren't designed to exist in changing environments and all of that. And I, I asked him originally because I had gotten to know David Tudor and Gordon Moomin, David Behrman, and a little bit of John Cage, and they were doing electronic stuff live with Merce Cunningham. And I thought that was kind of exciting, and I knew the stuff that we were going to be doing was quite different, but any, it was electronic amplified um, instruments, you know. And just a, a few years before that, that's when everyone uh, uh, was criticizing Bob Dylan for going electric, you know, because it, it was amplified uh, instruments in, in uh, being manipu manipulated live by human beings was just new. It was not done very often, if at all, because, you know, people would play tapes, and I thought it was always a, a deadly thing, you know, an audience sitting back and, and listening to a tape recording. It's kind of stupid, actually, but I still think so. So anyway, he said, yes, you can try it, but I'll tell you, you'll, you'll be up against a lot of stuff. I mean, don't let the sun shine on it. Don't be, let the temperature vary that much. But yeah, I can, I can let you use the, some of these things. So we, we started trying it, and, uh, and the first piece we did was that Easter piece, and it was only for two synthesizers plus a prepared tape at the time. Bob showed me the studio. I walked in and I, and as I've said to many people, it looked like the inside of a cockpit of a 727, which was the Boeing airplane of the day. And you look into those and you figure out how the hell do these people figure out where they're going and what they're doing. So he calmly told me how it works and what to do, but he was using sort of uh, engineering terms and I had no I had barely any science or engineering background and all of my education had been mostly in music. But I would, rather than embarrass myself, I would tell him, oh yes, I understand, I understand. And, and then when I was started messing around in the studio after I uh, actually got sound out of it, uh, you know, uh, I, found it, I found it fascinating. And, and then, and that would, together with meeting Tudor and Muma and those people who would bring their own special wired up contraptions that they only they knew how they worked I thought this would be a more you know standardized way of of doing things and I, I, I had a, it appealed to me because I had trouble hooking up my stereo at the time you know <laughs> so uh, it took me such a long time to, it took me six months to actually learn the synthesizer and really be good at it and Bob said that I took longer than anyone else and and in the process, of course, I ruined a lot of the modules. I mean, I'd be very embarrassed. And, and as I've told this story, uh, when I ruined my first module and the engineers came down to look at it, they went, oh, God, blah, blah. And they were talking all this engineering talk. And they said, I think we should call Bob down to look at this. And they did. And Bob actually came down and looked at it just for about three seconds. And he said, holy shit. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm out of here. because. <laughs> It ruined one of his designs, what it is what I did. And then he said, oh, don't worry about it. He kept going, I kept apologizing. He grabbed me around the shoulder, and he's, and he's not that kind of guy. He's not like a, a shoulder-grabbing person, you know. So he grabbed me around the shoulder, and he said, oh, that's fine, Dave. Don't worry about it. In fact, I'll take you up to uh, my office and my secretary. We'll give you a key, and you can just come in here anytime. In fact, at night, no one's here. You can come here and use it all night, but just leave it set up, and don't worry about a thing. So... 
that's how he was using me to, uh, to idiot-proof the equipment. The four-track tape recorder changed the way I, rec I composed, and uh, I had always loved the art of counterpoint through my whole life, well, since I was a kid, and uh, th through all of my schooling. I mean, I studied counterpoint almost every year. I took extra courses in it, and I kept thinking I'd get the epiphany from one of the, and I never got the epiphany beyond what I would hear in Bach. You know, I thought I'd hear this, they'd tell me the secret of why this is doing what it's doing, but no one could, and you have to, figure that out on your own and have your own sort of inner voice or inner intelligence direct you to what you what you think is is important and sometimes you get to it you know you you get to the piece and say this is just working so well and you look at it and you figure it out what's going on in a descriptive way and by the way I music theory doesn't exist you know I mean it isn't music it isn't theory it's description there is no music theory, because uh, I didn't realize that until this brilliant physicist friend of mine, who's also a musician, he said, uh, he told me that he was really excited to learn about music theory until he discovered it wasn't, it was just description. And I thought, you know, he's really right. And so I thought that the, the basic point was, was, was writing lines that could stand on their own and be combined, and when they were combined, they'd be more than the sum of their parts, and besides that, they would be, they would be interesting to listen to in, a, in almost a spiritual way or a powerful way that you couldn't predict by just figuring out what goes with what. You know, I, I was so taken with In C when I heard it because uh, coming from uh, every, all those composers uh, wanting you to write nothing but serial music, you know, and Gunther Schuller wouldn't even let me uh, play an octave, you know, I mean it was ridiculous, you know, that's an octave, we don't do that anymore. You know, when you listen to Steve Reich and Philip Glass, those, those are um, intellectually thought out as well as being inspired, and it's a great balance. with. With in C, all the air is let in, you know, and it's like, okay, over here we're going, we're going to let it flat in over here, and uh, we're just going to do the sharp over here, you know, and but it's all going to be cool, and you can go at your own pace. It's okay, we don't care, you know, just play it as many times, you, you know, and that's so liberating. I just love that. It was it was John Cage in in that way, but John Cage is even, uh, you know, he doesn't like you taking that much liberties. I mean, if he tells you to do something with how to prepare the piano and he tells you what to do in the music. He wants you to do that, you know. And then other times, you know, he'll let you do, you know, he'll encourage you to, you know, make, take your, do your own take on this or make up your entire part. But this piece was just wonderful, I thought, you know, at the time when it hit, you know, 66, 67. And then, then to have the producer be David Behrman, you know, of that recording, it, and who I had met in a whole other context. I, I just liked that whole world. And I, that's what aesthetically turned me around. Why? Uh, that's what, what what influenced the Easter kind of uh, droning and staying on the same thing. And the other and the technological influence was just Bob Moog, his 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 invention and his great generosity and and his friendship. You know. Mm -hmm. 